Good evening, everybody. Thank you for coming. It's a very special moment for the ICC. Um, and it's a particular pleasure as well to have the images of Parik Fiak here. Um, Parik was, is one of the great Northern Irish poets. He wrote about the North in a raw way, in a courageous way. And at the time, people were frightened of his poetry. So he wasn't given the attention that he really deserved. But as he moved towards the end of his life, he suddenly was recognised as one of the greatest poets. And these images um, you will see is his life's journey, but some of them are from the time he spent in London. And I know for a fact that he was almost homeless in London. He, he had nobody supporting him, he wasn't well. John took him into his home and looked after that poet, Parik. And he was a beautiful man, absolutely wonderful. Something very special as well is that he, his work is going to be read by our resident Irish, Irish poet, Nar McDevitt, oh. who I also think is oh. an amazing, <laughs> powerful and wonderful poet, and it's a pleasure to have Nar speaking Parrot's words, so that's going to be very special. So thank you all, and now I'm going to invite the wonderful Mr Minahan up onto the stage. <laughs> I feel it, <laughs> but no, Ross, as always, like these exhibitions, you know, I take the photographs, but there's so many other people in that conveyor belt of hand that make something, that we, how we climbed the mountain. And of course, Ross, Joe, Kevin, uh, Shay, uh, so many people are, are, are responsible for making Franco. the pictures. Franco, of course, absolutely. Joe. And, and Joe, of course, and Steve Ward, who printed the pictures. But it happened for me, because I, for many years I was going over to Belfast just to cover the troubles. And I, I, I met Brian Keenan. I'd known Brian, but we were drinking at the bar. And Brian was insistent. He was talking about Joe, who I got to know as Patrick Joseph O'Connor, born just off the, the lower falls. And he said, Minahan, because Brian was familiar with my pictures of Samuel Beckett that I'd taken in 1980, and we had little exhibitions around the place. And he said, John, you've got to photograph this man, because, and as Brian may have said himself, he was somewhat neglected when the, you know, you think of Northern Ireland poets, invariably they're all from the, uh, Irish poets are all from the North. The Heaney's, the Marnes, the Montagues, the Longleys, the Muldoons, and it goes on. And of course, this man, who I've always regarded what Francis Bacon is to poetry, into, to painting, Patrick Fig is to poetry. That rawness. I mean, I, and I just, when Brian was reading some of his poems, uh, I mean, I, I kind of, it just awakened something in me. And I, I, would, I would come over and photograph Padraig uh, a few years ago. And then, of course, in 19, 1986, Brian is kidnapped. He leaves one war-torn city to go to another. And I bring over, I thought, well, he had so much passion. I thought, I, I, I said, Padre, I'm going to take you to London. We're going to do readings. And of course, my wonderful, you know, friend, the, uh, the actress there, the wonderful Nora, has come along tonight with a book, one of Padre's, Mr. Cleveland's, 1987, when we were doing the readings in Minogue's. Uh, with Tony Rohr, Nora, and other people. We also, Vince Power, loaned us one Sunday morning, the, uh, the Mean Fiddler. And of course, I had a very good friend of mine, Bernard Stone, who had probably the most important literary bookshop in Europe. Torrid. Torrid bookshop, exactly. Mm -hmm. And of course, part of, we, we did a reading, and part of it was so excited because, he, you know, that's where he should have been. And he got to meet John Heath Stubbs, and of course, uh, 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 Brian which comes out in, in 19, uh, 1990 and, and Ross organises a show 
for his return uh, at the Pine Theatre. And it was, uh, I know when Ross does it, there's always some little kind of hurdles that come up around the place. But it happened, the rehearsal, and, and, and it, was for, uh, it was for Brian Keenan. And Brian is very special, so he, he must take a lot of credit for me through his own biography about an evil cradling. But Padraig, he loved Keenan, who was so courageous, because I remember Brian taking me, you know, he was from a different persuasion in Belfast to, to Padraig. And I remember Brian taking me around the Shank Hill, and it was really frightening <laughs> for me, because certain people were saying we were going to clubs called the Vulcan Club, and you're going up the stairs, and there's a picture of Queen, you know, in it is with the second. And the lad said, Hey Brian, we don't see much of you these days. <laughs> and I thought, Oh, no, it was kind of weird. And, uh, and of course, when Brian came back from there, he, he flew straight over to Dublin, where they debriefed him in McDays or whatever, you know what I mean? <laughs> he did quite well. But, and he's happily now in, um, living in, in County Wicklow. But that's it. And uh, as I said, I'm so, again, Delighted with the thanks to Peter Ross and the team, and it's just so wonderful. And please, God, we may do it again sometime, you know? Who knows? Yeah. Thank you! Me and John actually met Nile McDevitt about two weeks ago, and uh, we heard Nile read a poem for us. And I know John was just blown away um, and said, I specifically want Nile to read at this opening. Niall McDevitt is a wonderful poet. He's got his um, new collection coming out in the next couple of weeks or months, maybe very quickly. You'll hear about it at the ICC. It's a pleasure to have him here to read. He's a wonderful yes. ICC's resident poet, Niall McDevitt. <laughs> This poem uh, opens with a typical Fiac title. I think there's a hint of self-parody because it's really a tender praise poem to a friend of his who is with us tonight. A good shot <laughs> on being photographed by John Minahan in a medieval churchyard in Athai. Beckett welcomes you to Paris, so long as you don't bring a camera. <laughs> Beckett finds you, and not you him. He finds you in the time mirror of your own hometown of Athai, where you were only looking for your old young self. Where is the boy making his first Holy Communion? The mirror turns into a window. The window is spattered with the black earth of the dead in the berry hole. The berry hole is lucky, like the black hole that buries a dead star. And the dead are lucky, <coughs> like bird shit on the windshield of a new car. Oh, Poems about explosions. A slight hitch. March 1972. We wanted to think it was the quarry, but the pigeons roared with the white smoke, black smoke, and the ghost faced boy broadcaster, fresh from the scene, broke down into quivering lips and wild. Tears, can you imagine? And him live on the TV screen had to be quickly replaced so that the news could be announced in the usual cold, acid, and dignified way by the Northern Ireland British Broadcasting Corporation. <laughs> Explosion. In the wrong of being too broken to know or hate what hit them, as Irish as the perpetrator victim. Broken glass 
and brickwork eyes of police and army chiefs spin, suddenly dazed into human beings caught out of their British army uniform disguise, are suddenly vulnerable, are suddenly one of us, born, thrown to the ground with children screaming, what is it, mommy? Oh, mommy, what is it? Here's a couple that have a imagery of the robin redbreast. Uh, the first one is like a bird fable. It's a very ancient form of literature. Orange Man for Norman Dugdale. The sparrow and the blue tit eating greased potato skins are chased by the blackbird. He's chased by his own brown mate. She's chased by a shell in beak, stone banging, puffed out Norwegian thrush that a gang of tough looking starlings easily chases until a shrewd eyed navy blue jackdaw, the brute size of a graveyard raven, <laughs> invades the territory that the tiny orange breasted robin only thinks is all his own garden. <laughs> Just can't get let to stay that dead, lonely in. <laughs> and the second, uh, second Robin poem. Enemy encounter. Sorry, enemy encounter for lilac. Dumping, left over from the autumn, dead leaves near a culvert I come on a British Army soldier with a rifle and a radio, perched hiding. He has red hair. He is young enough to be my weenie bopper daughter's boyfriend. He is like a lonely little winter robin. We are that close to each other, I can nearly hear his heart beating. I say something bland to make him grin. But his glass eyes look past my side whiskers down the shore road street. I am an Irish man, and he is afraid that I have come to kill him. <laughs> I don't know everything, uh, but perhaps the Fiek was maybe like Brendan Bean, sexually ambidextrous. <laughs> um, and uh, this poem, you can see occasionally the poems just invoking that dimension, but this poem addresses it head on. Uh, it's called Rent Boy. <laughs> <laughs> to an Irish poet who asked me in French if I were a freak. Deprivation had my male elixir for a dry white wine to go with your cold luncheon meat. I am full of hunger. You are full of your soul, self. Bootlicking power must make you hate that which you fear. Christ, an odd man out cannot be bought, only rented like the whore. And, uh, I think I should read, this is probably, oh, perhaps his most famous poem. It's a big breath poem. <laughs> the British Connection, a litany of terror. In Belfast, Europe, your man met the military, come to raid the house. Over my death body, sir, he said, brandishing a real-life sword from some old, half-forgotten war. And used with real bows and arrows, and coppers and marbles good as bullets, and old-time threepenny bits and stones, screws, bolts, nuts, Belfast confetti, and kitchen knives, pokers, Guinness tins, and nail bombs down by the shore road. 
and guns under the harbour wharf and bullets in the docker's tea tin and jelly night in the tool shed and grenades in the scullery larder and weed killer and sugar and acid in the French letter and sodium nit chlorate and nitrates in the suburban garage in the boot of the car and guns in the oven grill and guns in the spinster's shift and ammunition and more, more guns in the broken down, rusted merry-go-round in the scrapyard. Almost as many hard-on guns as there are Union Jacks. <laughs> One phrase points to the future, Belfast confetti uh, anticipate, this is 1977, it anticipates Kieran Carson's famous uh, collection. It is the strange homemade shrapnel thrown by Harland and Wolf strikers at the riot squads originally. Um, but the word shift, the spinster's shift, shift looks back to the Playboy riots. The, the Abbey going audience was had plenty to be shocked about, but the final straw was that word shift, having the woman's undergarment. So I think, I think he would have been aware of the explosive quality of that word in the in, 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 in poem. Um, uh, there's a great long poem, but I think it's too epic to read tonight, Glass Grass. But I'm just going to read the final stanza of that. It's famous for its description of Belfast. Um, the chimney pots, fl flower, smoke, for tea time now. And Belfast is a beaten, sexless dog, hushed, waiting for when or where the next blow will fall. Against this black, the white seagulls glide in again, like hazy-eyed drunks, star the dark. So thank you very much. Thanks. <laughs> the imagery of Fiat's work. I really understand him more now for having listened to you read those poems. I've read them on my own, but I never... The imagery, and I really felt the troubles through those poems. They were beautifully read, and what an amazing poet he is, Fiat. And what a gift he is to all of us, and particularly in these troubled times, you know, to know that there's poets out there writing amazing poetry as you are yourself now, um, changing the world through the written word, not through the gun. So. Oh, yeah.